This is episode number 222 of the Plein Air Podcast with artist Kyle Buckland. And this artist is setting the world on fire. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping. It's always nice to have a great announcer, isn't it? Anyway, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. I'm Eric Rhodes. This past weekend, here in Texas, we have what they call blue bonnets, which are really lupines or lupins, depending on where you're from. They're these deep blue, iridescent blue uh, flowers. And sometimes, usually, we get these massive fields of flowers. And here in Austin, around my house, you know, there's a lot of them along the road and big fields. And they're starting to also get the orange flowers, which are called Indian paintbrush, uh, politically incorrect, of course, these days. Anyway, uh, we're seeing a lot, a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of blue bonnets. So I, there are some spots that I always go to to paint where they have fields and fields of them so you can get these, you know, really distant views of lots of blue. It's kind of fun. It's a big challenge. Anyway, I got in my car and I drove all the way out, which was about an hour, hour and a half. And <clears throat> lo and behold, no blue bonnets. Uh, as Charlie Hunter said in a comment, they were brown bonnets. <laughs> there were no flowers whatsoever. So I just set up and did a painting. It's a beautiful spot, an old building. It was a lot of fun anyway. And I was trying out a new easel. I'm always, you know, the easel people are always trying to get me to try their easels. I bought, I usually pay for them because I want to support them. So I bought a new one. I'm trying it out. I don't know if I'm going to like it yet or not, but so far I like it. But what I end up doing is whenever I buy an easel, I get my my drill out, my saw out, and I'm always making modifications to things so that I can come up with my my perfect scenario because you know when you're outside you want it to be easy you want to have it uh, exactly what you want and it's been hard for me to get that so I'm working on it anyway uh, any day painting is a good day right so I'm painting I'm having a good day and I'm usually posting those images on social media if you're at all interested uh, a lot of you are listening from around the world uh, 90 plus countries. And so uh, if you're not following me now, follow me on Instagram at Eric Rhodes. And Rhodes is spelled with an A and there's no E in Rhodes, right? Eric Rhodes. And then also follow on uh, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, whatever you want to follow on. All right. So we are thrilled that this podcast has over 1.5 million downloads. That's huge. And it's being heard in 90 countries. That's very huge, too. And the plein air movement is really catching on. I mean, it, it's really nice to see other countries. There's a lot of activity now happening in the UK and Scotland and starting to happen in France and Spain. And, you know, a lot of people are trying to make their movement much like what's been happening here in the U.S., which we're all very proud of and we've worked really hard to make happen. Now that COVID is hopefully over, uh, we're starting to see the plein air events coming back and people going out to events. We're seeing workshops. People are are getting outside. And I went to Mexico recently, my first trip, really. Uh, I was a little intimidated to get on an airplane, uh, I you know, because I've just been kind of stuck at home like you and everybody else in the world. And I got on that airplane and I was blown away that it was packed every seat, you know, and the airport was packed and people were I went down to San Miguel de Ente in Mexico and it was packed and, you know, not everybody, some people were wearing masks, but a few people, most of them not. 
And it's just like, feels like the world is returning to normal. So from my lips to God's ears, right? Anyway, uh, we are honored that the Plain Air Podcast has been rated the number one podcast in Feedspot's 2021 Top 15 Painting Podcast list. And uh, we're hoping to get it for 2022. You, you can help make that happen, I suppose. Anyway, subscribe to this wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's on Apple or Spotify or whatever. Uh, this podcast is now available on audio and video. So I'm starting, I'm going to start revisiting some of the artists that I've uh, done in the past, <clears throat> because those of you who are watching on video, we're going to show some images and so on when we're referring to paintings. We're not going to talk about them, but we're going to show them that way when you see it on video. And I post these on my Facebook and Instagram pages and so on. You can find them here. Now, um, as always on the podcast, after today's interview, we will have the Art Marketing Minute where I answer art marketing questions. And I will be doing art marketing for three mornings at the Plein Air Convention. So I'm pretty excited. We've got some pretty big news about the Plein Air Convention because as you may or may not have heard, we were told in New Mexico, we had to cut our attendance in half. We were only allowed a certain number of people. And even though the number of people we have booked already is bigger than our last convention, we were hoping to make it up a little bit because we've not been able to hold it for a couple of years. And so, but the state of New Mexico said, no, you can't do that. You got to wear a mask and do social distancing. Well, we just learned from the state of New Mexico and from Buffalo Thunder Resort that we're allowed to have no restrictions. We can have the full number of people come. Everybody can come now and we hope that you will. It's a little last minute, right? It's coming up May, May 12th. Uh, so you guys want to make sure, May 17th, I'm sorry. May 12th is the price increase. I decided to keep the price the same. Uh, we normally have to raise the price as we get closer to the event, uh, but I decided to keep it the same because most of you need a chance to, to register because maybe you weren't going to come before and now you can because it's free, free to come. And so anyway, we're very excited. There's no distancing, no masks, no, uh, no restrictions. And so please come. We really need you to come. We would love for you to come and we're going to have a great, great deal of fun. The plein air convention is four stages. We have a main stage where we have everything going on. And then we have watercolor or water media. Uh, we have pastel and we have what we call a demo stage. We have a big expo hall. We all go out painting together uh, and that's cool. And one of the things that we've just decided to add is we're now going to offer a virtual online registration. So for those of you who are a little reluctant to get out and, uh, you know, mingle, or maybe you can't, uh, you know, whatever, we are going to broadcast the main stage only, but that's huge. That's still like 27 hours of content, including Art Marketing Boot Camp, and you'll be able to watch it from home. So when you go to the plenairconvention.com website, you can go to hit register, and then you'll have an option for virtual or uh, in person. And we hope you'll come in person, but if you can't, at least you'll get a feel for it. Now, you're not going to get to go painting. You won't get to go to the expo halls. You won't get to go to all the extra stages like the watercolor stage or the pastel stage, but you'll see the main events on the main stage, and that's going to be pretty cool. I am also really, 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 really jazzed because um, – <laughs> I was, you know, talk about COVID and how like COVID just keeps clobbering you over the head. Well, we've been clobbered, right? We had to cancel the plein air convention, not once, but twice. We had to cancel the publisher's invitational. We had to cancel our figurative art conference. We were just, uh, you know, all we were doing is canceling and writing refund checks. It wasn't much fun. Well, uh, I created a trip to Russia. We were going to go to Russia. We were going to celebrate the great Russian art and go around the cities and the countryside and paint there. Well, guess what happened, right? So we have this conflict. We, we just don't, we're just not going to go. I mean, it's just not, we don't feel like it's safe to go. And so uh, what I had not told anybody is that we were going to go to next, to next year, we were going to go to New Zealand. Well, we already had all our homework done. We had the, the arrangements done with the 
the travel people, we're all ready to go. We could have gone anytime. So we just announced that we have painting New Zealand and we're going to paint for uh, 10 days in New Zealand. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, we have been there before on a painting trip one time and we have refined it, made it better, going to some in incredible places we couldn't paint before. And we're going to have more painting and it's just going to be incredible. Now we can only take 50 people. And the reason for that is, we, first off, I like to keep it fairly intimate. Secondly, we are going to go on a ship and stay overnight on a ship and go into the great, it's one of the wonders of the world, the great Milford Sound. And we we went there before uh, and it took us like forever on a bus ride to get there. And then we didn't have time to paint because we weren't planning on painting, but you had to see it if you're in New Zealand. Well, this year, the captain is going to be stopping the boat. We'll either be able to get off or we'll paint on the ship and we're going to be able to paint Milford Sound. This is like unheard of. This is a painting adventure like no other. So anyway, join us. 30 of the uh, uh, 30 of the 50 seats are already sold. So, or is it? Yeah, I think it's maybe it's 20 of the 50. I, I don't know. I'll have to check that. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are seats sold. And so you want to get one of those seats. It's a luxury trip. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be a lot of painting. And so that's at paintingnewzealand.com. Now, last but not least, uh, we believe that art competitions are really critically important for artists. It, they help you grow. They help you put yourself out there. You are putting yourself up against other artists so that you can find out how that feels. And what I'll tell you what happens because I enter other competitions. I don't enter my own, of course, and I usually use a dummy name so that I don't get any advantage whatsoever. But uh, I enter competitions. And when I know that I'm entering, uh, used to be, I think, okay, that painting's done. Now when I know I'm entering, it's like, uh, I need to work on that a little bit more. I need to make it a little better. So uh, what happens is competitions elevate you and your painting ability, your mindset, and you have a chance to win the cover of Plein Air Magazine and $15,000 in cash, the largest, largest cash prize, all cash uh, in the art industry. And so check it out. There's also lots of other cash prizes, about $33,000 worth, and lots of other recognition prizes like articles and things like that. And we have like 20 categories, 17, 20 categories, and you can go in there, pick a category. If you win in any category in any of the monthly competitions, you are automatically entered into the annual, which we will reward at the Plein Air Convention uh, coming up in May. So go ahead and get yourself entered into the Plein Air Salon. We also have uh, some early registration uh, uh, benefits if you get in and register early. So that's the pleinairsalon.com. All right. Well, I've done a, a, enough talking now. Let's get to our incredible guest. And I'm hearing a lot about this guy these days. Please welcome Kyle Buckland. Kyle, how are you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing great, Eric. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, we're we're loving having you, man. We you and I got a little bit acquainted um, uh, before you came here to our our Texas facility and and mm -hmm. shot an incredible new video, and we're really excited about that. So thank you. Well, thank uh, you. So wh what is the deal here, Kyle? Um, you're so hot. What? I, and I'm not talking about looks, mind you. You're very good looking, but you don't do anything for me. Uh, why are you so hot? What's happening in your career? You know, I think it's, um, I think what happened is as I, I made a decision, I, I put, um, you know, energy out uh, into the, into the universe, so to speak, or, or however you want to phrase it. I made this decision that I was going to uh, get my art out in front of people that, you know, I knew I had the passion. I knew that I had the love for it, the ability to wake up every day and, and, and focus on my artwork. Um, but what was missing was getting my work out there and really, Kind of stepping up my my game with um, connecting to uh, to viewers and to um, art appreciators and art collectors and um, you know I, I just I, I started putting one foot in front of the other and um, I, I put out a plan in my head of you know some things that I wanted to achieve and I worked really hard to to um, kind of see them come into fruition and I I I, um, I hope what's happening and it feels like is what's happening is that uh, you know I'm starting to see some of the the fruits of that labor uh, you know. Uh, pay off. Well, you, you almost caught me at a steeze there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 
So um, I, I just want to read your bio real quickly, just so others know about it. You were born in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, uh, you were you're like 1984. I mean, I was I was like already 100 years old by then. Um, your uh, parents fostered a deep appreciation in the arts and nature. We're going to talk about that a little bit. At 14, you read John Rewald's The History of Impressionism, and you being, began to take an interest in the French painters and their philosophies. At 16, he began painting a long and personal obsessive journal journey to attempt to capture those, uh, those nuances in the world around him. And today, his style of painting is deeply rooted in the fundamental philosophies regarding Impressionism. Uh, and, of course, that's why... Uh, being a, a, an impressionist and being a plein air painter works so well. You've been featured in plein air magazine on multiple occasions. You've won lots of awards. You've been uh, participated in conducted paint outs. You teach at every level. So it's really good to have you here. How did this all begin? Uh, how did you, you said your parents inspired you. Tell me about that. Yeah. So growing up, there was always art around our house. Um, my dad is an artist and he got uh, really interested in, uh, contemporary art and, and um, you know, he, he worked in New York City. He was also a, a journalist and he wrote some articles and actually had the opportunity to write uh, an article, an interview, uh, Andy Warhol and Jamie Wyeth when they were doing portraits of each other. Um, so he, he was, you know, ex he had that connection to art. And um, so eventually what happened, and this is kind of pivotal, is that he, he ended up working for a gallery called the Co-Kerr Gallery in New York. Well, the Co-Kerr was repping um, John Singer Sargent's, um, you know, before it was cool, <laughs> and Mary Cassatt's, um, you know, a lot of a lot of Impressionism. And, and my dad really, uh, although he wasn't painting Impressionism, he had a lot of respect for the Impressionists and, and um, for the revolutionary qualities in their work. And uh, so he started to research the Impressionists and, and started a collection of art books um, that, uh, you know, are basically revolved around French Impressionism, but also Impressionism in other parts of the world, American Impressionism, uh, you know, British Impressionism. Um, so when I was growing up, it was, you know, I was going through these phases like we all do. When I was younger, I used to skateboard and I was in a, a band and did different things. And, um, you know, it, it, it was it was when I got into high school. Um, something happened in, inside. I don't know. It was like a, a flip switched in my brain. Uh, I decided that I was going to just get into those books and start reading them. Uh, and I, I just fell in love with with the way that the impressionist painters represented real life. To me, these paintings felt um, they felt real and, and not not just looked real, you know, but they felt like what real life feels like to me. And um, it was neat because I had grown up around a lot of art and even. Um, I remember going when I was really little with my parents uh, to Philadelphia. We'd go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And, uh, you know, I didn't know really what I was looking at. I think a lot of it was I, I just I would walk with them. And I remember seeing these massive paintings. But it wasn't until I was a, a teenager that I returned. And I said, you know, let's go back to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And when I went there, it was just, you know, it was like I it took my breath away. I mean, to see these paintings in real life and to stand in front of a Monet painting, um, or, you know, just some of these massive landscape paintings. It just, it was funny. I would tell my parents would go around and look at other parts of the museum. I'd say, I'm just going to stay here in the, uh, in the impressionist wing. You can come back and get me when you're ready to leave. <laughs> well, I got to tell you that I think one of the things that you pointed out is something that I, I really believe in. And that is that, that, um, you know, you plant seeds, you scatter seeds into your kids and, uh, those seeds, uh, may not, take hold, but they might, you know, I used to take my kids to the Hearst Museum and in Moraga, uh, California, very close to where we lived. And I took them there because it was a great little museum and they had terrific content, but it was close to home. Right. And I was taking care of my kids. And so I would give the kids a sketch pad and I'd say, go find a painting and sit on the floor and look at that painting and see if you can draw it. And dad, we don't want to do this, but they would do it. They were about five years old at the time, started <laughs> that out. And, and uh, those little seeds, though, uh, you know, the kids would, would look at those paintings and they would say, dad, you know, I looked at it. The more I looked at it, the more I saw, the more things I discovered, the deeper I got into it. They didn't use that word. But, and, and 
that's what happened to you, right? You got into a museum and those were planting seeds. And, you know, maybe you didn't, it didn't resonate with you until you were older, but then you kind of went back and it, and you, it, and it pulled you in. Was mm -hmm. there a, a, a particular painting when you were a, a young kid uh, and you went in there, was there a particular one that you looked at and said, wow, that, you know, that really spoke to you? Yeah, I, I actually have memories of, of seeing the, the Van Gogh paintings at the National Gallery and being young and um, and uh, and and just the I think the expressive quality maybe spoke to the inner the inner child or the child in me at that time. Um, and so those those kind of stuck out um, as really having that, you know, making that impact. Um, but to be honest, it wasn't you know, it wasn't like you said, it was more on a subconscious level. It wasn't really at the forefront of my mind. Um, but when I came back, I think because I had made those kind of subtle connections as a child, when I came back as a teenager, um, it was almost like revisiting an old friend and getting to know more about them or, or yeah. something to that effect. So let's talk about paintings because most of us have artists who have inspired us. And of course, you know, there's always the big three, you know, it's Sargent, Soroya, Zorn, you know, we always hear that a lot. And that's fine because they're brilliant artists. But are there specific paintings uh, and uh, and by those or other artists that have really inspired you? And, and perhaps you can touch on what is it about those paintings that actually did inspire you? Um, sure. Uh, you know, well, if we look at John Singer Sargent, um, there are some paintings of his at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, that depict uh, water, um, just like a creek with some rocks underneath the water. And you can look through the reflection and see the rocks underneath of the reflection. Um, you know, I could just stare at those paintings for hours and it sounds funny, but I literally mean that. I mean, I can just stand there and just absorb every brushstroke. Um, you know, and it, it just amazed me. And it, it, it's, um, uh, you know, Sargent had a way of just putting down uh, colors and tones and then leaving them alone saying, OK, this is what I need here. Here's what this is. Here's how it needs to go. I'm going to put it there and, uh, you know, and it's going to land in the right spot. And if, if uh, you know, and then he would he would just he had this magic about the, the way the brushstrokes would come together. Um, you know, and it said, too, if he didn't get it right, you know, sometimes he would scrape the whole painting out and start again. So it wasn't like he was able to do this every time, but he knew when it worked and when it worked, he left it alone. And I think those paintings in particular uh, really show, um, you know, that that quality. Uh, Zorn, there's a painting of the Biltmore. Um, it's kind of a it's a dancing scene. Uh, Zorn and it has the typical Zorn palette with the very limited tones, the the uh, vermilion and the yellow ochre and ivory black and white, um, you know, and it, I, I, to, to me, that was where I learned about reserve, that you could do so much with so little um, to take, you know, and he had this big scene of these people dancing in the foreground, but they're kind of cast into a shadow. And then up in the corner, there's this uh, little vignette of sun, kind of a sunlit background and, and just amazing, just amazing descriptive brushwork um, in that painting. Um, now, uh, you know, Soroya, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Soroya's. Um, there's just, I love the way that he just made notes all the time. If you look at some of his smaller sketches and studies, that's, they were just quick observations of things around him, gestures, scenes on the beach, uh, you know, the poses of, a, of a, a child when they're, you know, playing in the ocean or something, just something very quick. And I, and, you know, for me, that was a lesson in how to just, you know, jot down observations so that you can use them um, you know, kind of as a, a uh, sort of a, in your toolbox, you know, more tools in your toolbox. Um, but there are other artists that really influenced me too. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about some of oh, the- Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got like paintings that inspired you from other artists? Yeah, so like Carlson, so John F. Carlson, um, uh, there's, you know, I found a book in my high school library. I was getting into painting. Uh, John Carlson, he he wrote the, the um, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. Um, and I found this book in my library. It was really, it was like a 1950s version and only a few people had ever taken it out. And I, I read it and it, when I first read it, I didn't understand much of what he was saying. It kind of went over my head a lot of, but uh, I got back into it and I read it again and I reread it and it really started to make an impact on me. And I started to look and think, you know, 
what, what artists did he teach? Because I learned a little bit about him. I was always interested in the history behind the artists too. I love art history. Um, for me, it goes hand in hand with, with, the, with the art. Um, so I learned about um, a painter named Emil Gruppi. And uh, Emil Gruppi wrote some books and I got a hold of those books, uh, Gruppi on painting, brushwork for the oil painter and Gruppi on color. Um, and his paintings just really spoke to me in, in, in a very um, profound way because they were so direct. I could look right at them and see what he was doing. It wasn't hidden under layers and layers of work, um, you know, as some of the other painters do. It's just so direct and it, it really spoke to me. Um, and so, you know, being being interested in art history, I looked, OK, well, Groupie taught. Well, you know, who did Groupie teach? And one of Groupie's uh, great friends and um, actually studied with him and then uh, helped him edit his books uh, was Charles Mavali. Uh, so, so I just kind of followed this lineage of artists, um, you know, going down the line. Um, and Mavali is a, he was just a wonderful composer. You know, a lot of these painters, um, if you think about the, the, the Cape Ann School and the Rockport um, Art Association and the artists up there, uh, Mavali talked about this. They were designers, they were composers. Um, one of my favorite quotes about painting comes from Charles Mavali, and that is, you know, you're not going to put the shapes where they are, of course. You're going to put them where they look good in your picture. Right. And uh, <laughs> when I heard that, I thought, man, that sums up painting, you know, almost in one sentence. And it's something that we can we often forget because we feel like we're tied to making a photographic representation of the scene or something. But really, it's our job as artists to take what we have there and to design it and compose it. Um, so just uh, he had an amazing ability to, to do that. And I think that came from some of the, the teachings of Groupie and then also from from Carlson. They were all great designers. Um, uh, uh, you know, it was funny because this was when I was about 18. I started to learn about uh, Carlson and Groupie, uh, Mavali. And uh, so I started looking up other artists that kind of worked in a similar fashion. And I found um, David Lucier online, who's a contemporary artist. Um, he's he's in Connecticut. Him and his wife Pam, they're both artists. And uh, I I reached out to him and I said, David, I love your work. I've been studying, you know, uh, Carlson and Groupie and Mavali. And um, come to find out, David had studied a little bit with Mavali and was actually, you know, knew knew Charles and 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 had uh, painted with him. And and so I. I I think I saw that I could see those kind of those ties in, in his work to that um, earlier group of painters. And I, I said, I, you know, I would love to send you some pictures of what I'm doing because I feel like, you know, I'm kind of following in the footsteps of, of what, what you're up to. And uh, he was really, really kind and responded really well to my work. Like I said, I was about 19 years old, 20 years old. Uh, I sent him some images and, and he loved it. And, and he invited me to come up and, and paint with him uh, and Pam on Monhegan Island uh, for for about a week and to study with them. And I was just so grateful because for me, it felt like I was becoming kind of inducted into this lineage of artists. That yeah, absolutely. Inspired me. And so uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure there now, because now that you're in the lineage, you're going to have to teach others. <laughs> That's right. I got to pass on the great wisdom. Uh, it's, um, but, you know, it's and it was it was just it was my first um experience kind of reaching out to uh, someone whose work I admired and and then having them you know kind of get back to me and it was so I, I found this camaraderie that I, I've you know seems to exist out there and it, it to this day I still experience that with with artists and it's nice because I'm in the position now where I get to give back uh, to, to artists and to students who are kind of coming up in the ranks and wanting to to learn about painting and so it feels like, you know, I'm starting to come full circle in my journey and I'm just so grateful to be in a position where I can do that now because it, it really meant the world to me um, back then to have that response from, from David when I reached out to him. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, there's it, I, another artist that really has just made an impact on me and this is kind of moving over, moving down the East Coast a little bit, but is Edward Redfield. Um, he was one of the Pennsylvania Impressionists and worked around New Hope and uh, Lambertville um, and his paintings are massive, you know, like he would he would walk out into nature with a 50 by 60 canvas, 50 by 60 inch canvas strapped to his back and go out and, and in one day and come back with that thing finished. And you so know, I, I should just mention that there's a tradition in the East. Um, it probably started by Redfield and all those guys where they would paint large on location. And I have many friends back east who live in Vermont and, and uh, 
you know, other other areas where they're painting, you know, 30 by 40 or, or larger on location. They're using these old Cape Cod easels and, and, and you know, and, and the rest of us are painting, you know, nine by 12s or eight by 10s. And, <laughs> and uh, one of them, I asked one of them one time about it and he says, well, you can't make any money with a nine by 12, you know, so, <laughs> and, and, you know, they'll paint a, a massive painting in the same amount of time that I'll paint a little one. You know, they're so bold and so courageous. So I think that's very cool. So you were talking about Redfield. Yeah, Red, I mean, just, and, and you know, I think something about that work ethic, you know, it was like th these these were hardworking painters. They went out and they, you know, they, they went out into the elements. They stretched their own canvas. They, uh, like you said, uh, modified your, your easel. If you needed something, you, you made it work for you, um, you know, and they went out in all sorts of weather, sometimes hiking through a foot of snow, um, you know, and, and they got the job done. And, and to me, that was really, uh, really inspiring because I felt like, you know, not only is it important to have the passion, but it's also important to have the discipline um, to, to pursue and, and to kind of fuel that passion. And that's what I saw in, in Redfield. If you uh, ever make it to Jeffersonville, Vermont, uh, there's a, a little gallery there, actually a pretty big gallery, and they have um, a, uh, a trailer that was built by one of those artists. I think it was Redfield, but I may be wrong, uh, where they it was basically a glassed-in trailer, horse-drawn, and it had a potbelly stove in it. And this artist and a couple of his friends would stand inside and paint winter scenes and stay warm. I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> yeah, a little ingenuity there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, they were, uh, Redfield was a quick thinker. That sounds like Redfield. I'll tell you a quick story I read about him. And it was, he lived on the Delaware River um, in, uh, in I think, Lambertville or New Hope or somewhere up there. Um, and he, they would bring coal barges that went to Philadelphia. And um, these coal barges would, would be, you know, piled high with, with big chunks of coal. Um, and they would go by and uh, he got this bright idea. He said, you know, he went down to the river and he painted uh, a huge target on a board, um, you know, that had different numbers and a, a red bullseye and massive, you know, was like six foot by six foot board out there and put it on the side of the river. Well, the, the guys that were running the barges would get bored as they were taking the coal up to Philadelphia. So when they would come by his house, they started a game of trying to throw chunks of coal and hitting the bullseye. Well, he'd go down with his family at the end of the day and collect up all the coal and he would heat his house with it. Oh, that's brilliant. That's yeah. Brilliant. So he, he was. Uh, so thinking I have, about a, I have a question for you. Uh huh. All right. You know what they call an artist who's married to another artist? I probably should know that one, but I. <laughs> Broke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, of course, that's that's really not true. But I, <laughs> you were married to another artist. Tell me about that. Yeah. So my wife, um, Jennifer Counts Buckland, is also an artist and she's um she's a renaissance woman. I'll tell you what, she keeps me on my toes. She she um, is just a creative soul through and through. And um, so she's she's gotten into some plein air painting, I think, just kind of by hanging around me, she loves to to go out. We sometimes take our, our work out or, or, you know, our equipment out and paint together. Um, and we just really enjoy it. We, you know, we, we, we met, we went to high school together, but we, we didn't really hang out in high school. And we actually reconnected through some mutual friends a couple years later. And um, we both had an interest in art and it was just, you know, that was kind of what we immediately built our friendship and on later our relationship on was just, hanging out and making art together and talking about art. And, um, you know, I, I always say, and I'm half joking when I say this, but, you know, I knew she was a keeper when uh, I was working on a painting and I was struggling with it. And, and she, you know, she was back there in, behind me. She said, you know, if you, if you move that line just a little bit over here, <laughs> that that might fix the composition. And I, I, I looked at it and I said, you know, you're right. <laughs> you, know, I, I'm curious, but, you know, sometimes there's a, spirit of competitiveness you know and and you know what's that like is it it, it sounds it's a, like you know, a very positive experience overall it is uh it takes there's a dynamic uh you know there's a there's a quality that you have to foster when you're two artists that work together where you where you respect each other's boundaries um you know and i think that working together we've even shared studios we share a studio now uh, of course i'm out in the field a lot but when i am working in the studio uh we share a studio together 
And um, we've, we've figured out how to make it work. I mean, um, you know, we know when you're in the zone, you're in the zone and you don't want to be bothered. And so I think we, we both have that feeling of like, um, you know, if we're in, in, in our, in our zone and we're doing our thing, um, then it's art time. And, and, you know, I, and I think just kind of having that relationship and, you know, of course there are struggles, you know, sometimes, um, you know, just, uh, having two creative people that, you know, live together can, can create some, a little yeah, bit. of living, you know, that's, <laughs> so, But the, so the, the rewards for me are worth it. It's, you know, we, we get to share the joy of creating together. And, um, you know, I couldn't think of, uh, you know, a better person to, to spend the rest of my life with. It's really a, a, a wonderful relationship. And, um, and it's, it's built around art. I mean, ever since we, like I said, when we first got together, uh, you know, it was that was kind of what brought us together was our mutual interest in in right. art and she's just super talented. I'm going to throw a, a monkey wrench into this because I I love to ask unexpected questions. So are you ready? I'm ready for it. Let me have it. Let's call this a lightning round. All right. So you're going to have to give me a brief answer and we're going to give some some art or painting instruction verbally to our audience. You ready? Sounds good. All right. Give me something on composition or design. Okay. Look for the big shape first, whether it be an S, a circle, a triangle. Look for the big shape to build your design on. All right. Color harmony. Limit your palette. The, the, the less colors you have, the more easily you're going to obtain color harmony. Understanding edges. Sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the lost and found. Uh, look, you know, look at nature. Look at Sergeant, then look at nature. Try to see in nature what Sergeant saw in nature and then try to see it your own way. But nature is always lost and found. There's, you know, you can't see everything at the same time. You can only see a little bit. So practice that. And then also one other thing, this is brief, practice looking at your peripheral without really looking at it. So in other words, stare at your center of interest and mentally take note of what the peripheral looks like without moving your eye off of the center of interest. Um, that's how you want to paint that peripheral area. You don't want to stare at it and then paint it like you're staring at it because you're not. You should be staring at your center of interest. All right. Now here's one. Center of interest. Center of interest. Don't put it in the center of your canvas. Right. <laughs> um, what is your story, right? What story are you telling? Um, if we don't know the answer to that question, then we can't decide what our center of interest is because the center of interest is directly related to the story you're telling. It's the main point and theme to the story. Finding your own voice. Don't try to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's like it's like handwriting. You know, your handwriting develops because you have something to write. Um, follow your heart. Paint what you love. Be influenced if you have to be. I mean, I think we all have to be a little bit. Um, you know, even if that means emulating another artist that you appreciate their style, don't worry about that. Um, Robert Henry said, you know, your originality will stick with you for better or worse, and there's nothing that you could do to get rid of it. So uh, it'll be there. Just just you know, follow your heart and do the work. Last but not least, forcing yourself to get to the next level. Can you say that one one more time? Forcing yourself to get to the next level. How do you do it? Yeah, I think it, it's, um, you know, knowing, knowing that um, there's always that next painting and that there's nothing stopping you from making the next painting better than the last. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean it has to be better than the last. But it means that you're on a, a path and that there's there's not a you know, it's not about the destination. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's really true with art. It's the journey. It's about the experience. So, um, you, you know, it's not once you once you understand that and you want to keep, you know, you want to you want to keep the creative juices flowing, then it, it, it happens more naturally. And so it's it's less about forcing it. And it's about just understanding uh, your personal growth. and um, you know, like I said, be inspired, find artists that you love and, and study with them and, um, and, you know, study their paintings and, and, and take it one step at a time. If I were to ask um, anyone who's listening to this podcast in 90 countries, 
if they ever had a pivotal moment in their life or a pivotal year, if you were to ask me, I'd have a couple of pivotal years. 1973 would have been one of mine. I know you, you were not even thought of yet at that point. Um, and, I, and I won't get into why, but what was your pivotal year and why? Uh, it definitely would have to be 2017. And um, I'll tell you what happened. I have been painting since, uh, you know, two, since probably the year 2000, since I was in high school. Um, and I, I, for a long time, I didn't show my work. I just painted. Um, I, I worked uh, as a scenic artist for a theater and then I painted kind of uh, when I would get home from work and uh, different things. And I always, I mean, I wanted to show my work, but I was a little timid and, um, you know, I think I'm naturally an introvert. Um, and so, you know, getting out and, and going to shows and entering competitions and doing, doing the plein air events was not necessarily uh, second nature for me. It was a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, but I made a decision in, in 2017 that I was going to, um, you know, pursue this uh, profession with everything I've got. And that meant stepping outside of my comfort zone. So I got online and I started looking at uh, plein air painting competitions. You know, I knew I knew about everything that was going on, but I just hadn't stepped kind of off that little safety net and, and gotten out there. And I uh, signed up for um, uh, an event in Floyd, Virginia, um, the Floyd Plein Air Biennial, which it was their first year. Um, but they had um, they had some some big names coming. Um, Valerie Craig was the the judge that year and they had some some great artists that uh, got selected and I got juried in so I was like okay this is a good step you know and at the same time I found out I was also juried into Bath County which was another one I, I basically just lined some up and said I'm going to try to get you know get into some of these shows um, so in August of 2017 I went to the Floyd Plein Air Festival and uh and competition and i started uh painting and i started looking at the paintings that were there i met a lot of the artists that i had known through facebook and through social media um but it was so great to get out there and to meet them in in real life and to speak to people face to face and um and to see their work you know in person um it just inspired me and i felt like okay this is you know this is what i want to do and um a lot of these artists had already you know established a good career so i was able to look at them and say this is what I want, um, you know, and I think, you know, you hear about, you know, if you, if you see somebody that's, that's successful at what you want to do, you should, you know, go physically be near them, figure out how to get around them and see how they operate. And so that's, you know, that's what, what I was doing. And, and um, I, I also felt like, wow, I really need to step up my game and paint the, you know, the best paintings that I can paint here because the competition was stiff uh, and I was aware of that. And um, so, you know, they got to the announcing the awards and, uh, you know, you just everyone if, who's ever been in a competition knows the feeling. You're just sitting around, you're waiting, your heart's beating, you're thinking, oh, they, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And, um, you know, they announced the the, the uh, runners up and then third place. And I didn't hear my name in second place and I still didn't hear my name. And I'm thinking, OK, well, I guess I didn't win anything, but I still had a good time here, you know, because I thought there's so many other artists here. Surely, you know, I couldn't get the best in show. And then they announced my name for the best in show. And it was just like this feeling of confirmation that I was where I was supposed to be, um, that I was doing what I was supposed to do. Uh, the painting that won Best in Show was a nocturne that was painted on location underneath of one of these orange street lights. So it was a really bizarre experience, um, but the, the, the outcome was really awesome. And then to have that, uh, that feeling of, um, of accomplishing, you know, that was, that was really a catalyst. I was like, there's no turning back at this point because I made the decision. I put the the you know the dream out there, so to speak, and then I I took the steps to get there. And um, it just my my career just really started to 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 take off after that moment. Um, I got into more events the next year. Um, I was you know submitting to competitions. I was juried into the Oil Painters of America uh, National. Um, I got accepted into into Easton. Um, you know, was able to make some connections with you all at Streamline and, and was able to do some some uh, work for you. And now to do the, the video um, through Streamline, uh, it's really it's just, you know, I, I, I feel like I said before, just so grateful because I I saw this before it happened. And I, I tried to feel the feeling of it happening before it was happening. And you hear about that, you know, about manifesting or about putting energy out. And I think it's really just kind of 
clicking into that zone and saying, this is what I want. You know, I'm already grateful. I know it's coming to me. And things started to fall into place. And all the way up into this moment, I mean, I'm here, you know, talking to you. I'm going to be teaching out at the, the plein air convention and expo in Santa Fe, um, you know, next month. So it, it really just sort of took off from that moment. Well, Kyle, we're happy to have you at the plein air convention. It's exciting. You're going to be out working with other artists out there, helping them out. And that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm I, I, I think what, you, what you've pointed out here is something that is really worth discussing just a little bit more depth. You know, you talked about, you know, the, the idea of manifesting something and I'm a big believer in a lot of that, but it's, it's manifesting plus action. And in this particular case, you put yourself out there, right? And, that's why I talk about entering competitions, uh, entering plein air events, because there's something that shifts or should shift in your mind mindset that uh, once you know you're competing with other artists and you're going to be judged and people are going to be paying closer attention, you are there's something in your head that clicks that says I better I better really do a good job on this. Mm -hmm. it, it's I remember having an experience of, I was painting next to somebody. I think it was probably Richard Schmidt. And I thought, oh man, I'm painting next to Richard Schmidt. I got to be as good as I can be. I got to pull myself up and, and, and do a better job than I normally would because I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of him. And, and I know I couldn't impress him because nobody could because he's, you know, is the best of the best, but, but, uh, it, you know, there's something that clicks and, uh, and, and the same thing with plein air events, when you're out painting by yourself versus you're painting at a plein air event, you know, you gotta, you gotta knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, there's an energy at those events that you, you can absorb. I mean, if you're, if you're, when you, when you go there, you feel it, it's palpable. You, you feel the excitement and, um, the almost a sense of urgency to capture uh, the moment, you know, and I think that by um, getting together with other artists that, that you can really foster that energy. Uh, it's easy to just sit around by yourself. You know, you think, oh, I'm in my comfort zone. And um, but, you know, if you want to advance your career, um, you know, if you want to get out there, if you want to sell paintings, that's another thing that happened. As soon as I started getting out to these events, I started meeting gallery owners. I started to go to uh, shows and, and um, you know, talk to um, promoters and, and uh, art dealers that were interested in, in selling my work. And it really opened up a lot of doors that would have never been opened if I had just stayed kind of here in Southwest Virginia and just painting and posting my work on Facebook. Um, you know, it, it really took getting out there and, and, and meeting people um, to, to, to make that kind of that next uh, Step. Well, I want to ask you. I want to ask you. You talked earlier about all those um, those painters in the Northeast, Redfield and Mulvalley, and all those guys uh, that they're painting big. Mm -hmm. are, are you also painting big? Absolutely, I love painting large. It's 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 become one of my favorite things to do. Uh, the challenge of uh, taking a large canvas out on location. Um, I worked with Shamrock Boxes to design a, a box, the, the Gloucester painting box that fits uh, very nicely onto the Gloucester style easel. Um, you know, those, those old easels are great. The Gloucester style easels, I, I use a take it easel and they're really strong easels. They have a great, um, you know, footprint, the wide footprint that really holds these big canvases. But I needed a painting tray that stuck out in front of the canvas because some of these canvases that I was taking out were so large, 48 by 60, that there wasn't any room for a paint box. So uh, I worked with Shamrock Boxes to design the Gloucester box, which comes in three different sizes. Um, and it's a great it's a great tool for painting large. It's almost like having a studio tabaret outside with you. Um, but, you know, for me, I love swinging a big brush. I love painting from the shoulder. Um, it becomes almost like a dance. Um, you know, I think I just read a quote where somebody uh, was talking about Soroya that they said he painted like a pig eats. <laughs> And in other other words, that he painted very quickly and, you know, uh, you know, with a lot of um, uh, vigor. And I think that when you're painting large, to me, it feels more natural to, to, to paint with vigor and to get, uh, you know, to get a lot of energy into the work, which is for me one of the uh, 
most important qualities is to have a sense of energy that you sense when you when you look at the painting. So I love, you know, 36 by 48, 48 by 60. Um, you know, it's it's I always tell people just pretend it's a nine by 12 and pretend that you shrunk. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> with the, the you know, the tip those of us who paint plein air are typically not painting more than about two hours, sometimes three, because the significance of the light changes, the angle changes, everything changes. It, you know, it's always changing constantly anyway, but three hours, it's a lot different. Are you able to conquer a, a large canvas in the same amount of time the rest of us are conquering a nine by 12? Uh, usually, yeah, that's that's usually kind of the, the goal. I love a la prima painting. I think that uh, when you paint all at once, it's easy to get kind of this sense of the, the experience in it. Um, that for me can sometimes be disrupted if I have to return over and over and over again. Uh, you know, everybody's different. I know some artists do fabulous work doing that way. But for me, it's it's been about just kind of that immediate experience. And so, you know, I, I, I often laugh. I say I probably look like a lunatic when I'm out there painting because you really have to move your body around. <laughs> uh, sometimes I even tell people if you're going to paint large, you might want to do some stretches before you start painting. Uh, well, it's tough on the shoulders. You know, yeah, Karen Oster always painted very large, not always on, on, on location, but he had a big brush that was, you know, like seven feet long and, and had a big head on it. And he would dip that into a giant pile of paint. And he's using both. <laughs> well, you see those brush. photos of Soroya painting with the big long handles. Yeah. Um, we actually used, I worked, when I worked for the theater, we used uh, bamboo sticks. We would put uh, paint brushes in to paint. We were painting 20 by 40 foot backdrops. Um, so you would paint them on the ground uh, and you'd use these big sticks, you know, with the with the bamboo, with the brush stuck in the end. Uh, so that really helped open up my mind about scale. All of a sudden, a 36 by 48 didn't seem so large. No, well, I would imagine take, doing a backdrop for a theater is a big job. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of I did a mural one time and I thought, why did I commit to this? Because <laughs> it's a big job. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of, lot of surface to, to yeah. cover. Yeah. Um, well, um, I should mention, you know, I mentioned early on that you put together this video with us called Courageous Color. Um, you know, I, this certainly isn't intended to do this, but give us like uh, 10 seconds on uh, what that, that video will do for people. Well, yeah, what it will do is it'll allow you to be much more confident in your color choices and to be able to very quickly decide what colors you need to tell the story that you want to tell uh, in your painting. Outstanding. Well, Kyle, this has been a terrific podcast. You're, you're an inspiration to us all. Uh, I love the fact that you, you're painting large. I should mention to you, you mentioned Group A. Uh, I, I have one of my most cherished possessions is I have a, a Group A original in my collection. Oh, that's I'll a, that's a treat. Sometime. Yeah, I'd love to see it. And uh, I just feel very lucky. You know, I, I feel as though when, when you have a, a great painting from a great artist, I feel there's a responsibility that comes with it. And uh, so you, you mentioned those guys. I, I love all of them. I don't, I don't have any, any Movali. I had a chance to meet him and I missed it. But I met a lot of his friends and people who studied in the lineage that you're now in. And, and that's pretty cool. So we have yeah. a lot of those people come to the um, uh, the fall fall event or the Adirondack event that I do, the Publishers Invitational. So you have to come up to that one of these days. Yeah, uh, I'd love to. So any final words of inspiration to anybody who might be thinking about picking up plein air painting or might be kind of early in their journey? Sure. Yeah, I would say, you know, um, you know, figure out what you love, you know, find the things that you love and then paint those things uh, and push yourself a little outside of your comfort zone, you know, if, and whether that means, you know, uh, getting out into more events or signing up for a class um, or just tackling a subject that maybe you wouldn't tackle, um, you know, naturally. Don't be afraid to experiment um, and have fun. I always tell everyone when I'm teaching at the heart of what we're doing, I mean, it's very important what we're doing, but we want to have fun because if we're having fun, then we'll want to do it again. And if we do it again and we do it again, we'll get better and better. It's inevitable. So um, just get out there, push paint around and, and enjoy yourself. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for, for being on this. Uh, tell us real quickly what your website is. 
Sure. Yeah. My website is kylebuckland.com. I'm on Instagram at Kyle Buckland Fine Art and also on Facebook at Kyle Buckland Fine Art. And I have a YouTube channel, The Artful Souls. Outstanding. And and also your video is at paint-tube.tv, which is the new name for, for Streamline's video business. Paint-tube.tv. Yeah. Just search Kyle Buckland and you'll yep. find it there. Uh, really terrific, Kyle. Thank you again for being a part of the Plein Air podcast today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just uh, honored and uh, privileged to be here. Well, we're honored to have you. Okay, you guys, now we're going to get into some art marketing. You ready for this? Let's go. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. The Marketing Minute has uh, its own podcast. If you don't have a chance to listen through the Plein Air podcast, if you want your marketing I answer these questions and they go to this podcast and they also go to the marketing art marketing minute podcast. And you can find that wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and you can upload a question on video uh, or you can leave us a voicemail or you can email me. Um, at, you can upload your video question at artmarketing.com slash questions and, or you can email me Eric at artmarketing.com. So, my producer, Amadine, who is from France, just got back from France, is going to read the questions. And uh, Amadine, what is our first question? Our first question is from Mary from New York. I'm trying to create a database to send newsletter to potential customers for my workshops. How do I get more email addresses? How often should I send a newsletter? And what to include to catch their attention? What to include to catch their attention. All right. So... Uh, uh, you know, that's a really good question from Mary P. And, and I tell artists, artists are uh, oftentimes confused about what direction to go, what they should be focusing on. There's a lot of things that are seducing artists that they think are going to, you know, open the world up and change their world. And, you know, tons of money are going to come there, uh, fall in their lap. And, and the one thing I tell artists is the most Get this, the most important thing that you can do as an artist, other than, of course, creating your artwork, which is important, more important, the most important thing you can do is creating a database. Now, a database is basically the names of people that you're going to market to. Now, you're going to market in a lot of ways, but when you have your own database or your own database, depending on how you say it, you now control the narrative. You're not having to rely on Facebook or Instagram or advertising or other things. Now, you're going to do all those things, too, once you get marketing, but you want to have your own database. So how do you build a database? Well, the first thing is um, you don't just want names because names are of no value. You want valued names, right? So who do you want as an artist? You don't want other artists on your database unless, of course, you're selling workshops. And then you want to have a database for artists. And that way you can contact them about your workshops or your trip to Italy or whatever you're doing. And But you don't want to be marketing the same to your artist friends as you are to your potential buyers. Now, I will tell you there is a caveat in that, and that is that Artists buy a lot of paintings. Uh, artists buy demo paintings at, at workshops, but artists buy a lot of paintings in a lot of ways. So don't ignore them, but you want to get people in your database who are interested in you and your art. Uh, you don't want every person you meet, every Tom, Dick, and Harry, you know, it's not, you don't want to be like, hey, do you want to join my database? So you want to, you want to look for people who are truly interested people who could become customers, and certainly everyone who's ever bought a painting from you or expressed interest in buying a painting from you is a person you want to put in your database. Now, you can find a lot of ways to keep your database. You know, you can use an Excel spreadsheet. I think some of the uh, services out there, maybe like Artwork Archive or Fosso or something, may have some ways you can manage your database, or you can use things like you know, constant contact or a lot of other email programs. And you want to keep a database 
And you want to keep it up to date uh, because if you start mailing, emailing to names that the addresses have changed and they're not responding, Google and others will penalize you and stop delivering your other email. These are things most people don't understand. So you want to build a database and you want to have a regular communication with that database. Now, regular is up to you. Uh, most artists have a monthly newsletter and a monthly newsletter is a decent amount of touch points, but you certainly can have more, but you got to have something to say. Now, the other part of her question is, um, well, first off, how do, let me finish that part. How do I get email addresses? Ask everybody that you meet that has any interest. The other thing you can do is put bait, bait, right? Like bait at the end of a fishing pole line, right? So what you want to do is find something that people are interested in and offer it to them for free, right? What is somebody who's interested in your work interested in? Well, they might be interested in learning more about you. So you could have an ebook on uh, the 10 best Kyle Buckland paintings ever, right? And uh, and have that on your website. Hey, free ebook. Or you could have, you know, join my newsletter list. Most people don't want to do that because they're like, oh, I don't want another newsletter. But unless you give them a compelling reason, and we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, a lot of people put these in their ads, you know, get my free ebook on this or my free gift. You know, if, if you get a name of someone who's going to spend money with you, there's nothing wrong with spending money to get that name, right? You know, you might spend a buck or three bucks or five bucks or a hundred bucks, depending on how, how convinced you are they're going to spend money with you. Now, as far as uh, newsletters, how do you catch their attention? Here's what not to do with newsletters. Ready? Don't talk about yourself. Every artist newsletter I get, and I get a lot of them, and most of them I don't open, they're like beating their chest. It's all about me, baby. I'm talking about me. Well, the reality is you don't want to be talking about you. You want to be talking about them. So what does that mean? Give them something that is of value to them so that they're going to open it up. If your subject line says, you know, my latest paintings yawn, boring, right? But if, you're, if your subject line says seven ways to collect paintings or 10 ways to restore paintings or how to take care of your art collection or, you know, come up with things that matter to them, then do a lead story about that. Now you can figure out how to incorporate yourself into that and then you can put other things about you after that, but you've got to get them to open that email. The most important thing that you can write is the subject line of an email. The second most important thing you can write is the headline of an email. And if you get them to read that headline, the next most important thing is the photograph and the first paragraph, because you've got to get them and you've got to pull them through it. Each little thing pulls them through. So that's what you do and make it about them, not about you. And it will change your life. I guarantee it. I have artists that I have doing this and they're knocking it out of the park and they're selling lots of paintings. And remember, remember the person you sell a painting to every time you sell a painting. Here's what I want you to remember. Do you want fries with that? You go to McDonald's. Do you want fries with that? They're always upselling you. And now you're not going to say that, but you can say, hey, since you bought a painting from me, uh, I would like to gift you a second painting at a deep discount um, if you buy it today or, or some hook like that. It's got to be legit. It's got to be real. It's not going to be dishonest. You don't want to do any of those games, but give an opportunity. Say, you know, here's a painting I, I actually intended for this one and this one to hang together. And if you, uh, since you bought this one, I'll sell you this one for like 20% off or something. And now you're getting another sale and you might even be able to do that two or three times. I've, I've seen it happen. I've, I've had it happen. I sold one guy five paintings one day uh, and he was thrilled about it. And of course I was thrilled about it. Okay. Amadine, what's our next question? The second question is from Nancy Herman. I'm an 82 year old artist. I have, over the years, produced art in several media. I'm going to open a gallery soon. I want to sell my work 
and eventually sell other people's work too. How to handle the first opening? I'm planning to have videos showing outside, which will have a little bit of everything with music. Is this all too confusing? Any advice you have would be much appreciated. All right, Mary. Well, Mary, I'm going. I'm going to. Or no, it's Nancy. Nancy Herman. Nancy, <laughs> applause. Everybody listening, applaud because Nancy is 82 years old and she's opening an art gallery. You go, girl. Listen. Half of this is about mindset, right? She's not giving up or giving in or saying, oh, I'm getting old. No, she's like, I'm opening a gallery. I'm going to have that gallery for the next 50 years of my life. All right, Mary or Nancy. <laughs> All right. So so I would, uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to own an art gallery, but I've turned it down every time. People bring me their deals and say, you want to buy my gallery? And I turn it down every time because... I don't want to compete with my advertisers, uh, but I do know what I would do if I owned an art gallery. And I like marketing and I, I think marketing is so critical. A lot of art galleries are artists who want to uh, get into the art gallery business. It seems very glamorous and wonderful. And a lot of times it's a, a spouse, a husband, a wife, you know, who's looking for something to do and they think it's going to be easy. It isn't easy, folks. It's not easy. The failure rate of art galleries is high. The ones you see out there that survive year after year, pay attention to what they do because they're doing it right. Now, what do you do when you open a gallery? That's a, you know, there's a book. There's a whole book on that. But go back to that start on building database. You know, you have one chance to make a first impression, no matter where you are. If you're opening a gallery, if you have a tent in an art show, a tent show, uh, you have one chance to make a first impression. Now, my wife and I went to this big antique show uh, the other day, and we're walking through this tent, and there's booth after booth after booth after booth, you know, and there literally are hundreds of booths, and one booth stood out head and shoulders. It had you know, really impressive graphics and it had big, long, beautiful velvet curtains and it had lights on it and it just drew you in. And so we spent a lot of time in that booth. We didn't spend any money, but we could have. And so you want to look for an opportunity. Whatever you do, make a first impression. Now, a lot of people think, well, I'll start small and then grow and get big. But if you start small you need to understand that people will perceive you as being small. You want to start big. Whatever you do, you know, that gallery opening needs to be the event in your town for the year. You need to have a band. You need to have celebrities. You need to have the mayor. You need to have a ribbon cutting. You need to have incredible food, incredible music. You've got to, you know, you want to make it look like you're the most impressive gallery on earth. And if somebody who knows what they're doing walks through the door and they find a bunch of junk, they're never coming back. But if they walk through the door and they see excellence at every turn, you know, good paintings by great artists, they're going to come back. They're going to come back time and time again. You will not disappoint. You need to learn how to do events. Um, look at Castle Gallery in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Great little gallery, beautiful building. They're always doing events. The other thing they do, and I know this because I'm in that gallery, they work the newspaper. It seems like every week there's an article on that gallery in the newspaper because they've always got art shows and they've got music going on. They've all kinds of things there, and they're always drawing people in. Valentine's Day celebrations and Mother's Day, you name it, they've got it, and that's a great thing to do. So, uh you know, make the opening great. Make sure you do a speech. Have somebody prominent do a speech. You know, do a toast and, and you know, just have a great time. Explain the importance of art and that will help you. Now, you said I'm going to show a video with music outside the gallery. You know, why not put a live band outside the gallery with a sign, please, says grand opening, please come in. Don't make it exclusive. Let everybody come in. And why, you know, if you're going to do a video, Make sure that it's a, a loop that's no more than seven seconds, right? Think of it as a billboard. You're walking by, you got six seconds to get their attention. You got something long and drawn out, that a lot of words, they're not going to pay attention. So 
figure out a message and something bright and colorful and, you know, paintings going by very, very quickly and send that message in seven seconds and repeat that, have it be a loop and just repeat it over and over again. I used to do trade shows at conventions and I would do that while everybody else had these long drawn out videos, nobody would ever watch. Mine were like getting your attention, three, four seconds of content, boom, you nailed them. All right. So that's what you do. I will write a book just on how to open a gallery sometime, maybe. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to make that commitment right now. <laughs> anyway, I hope this has helped and I hope it's not uh, a little bit too confusing, but uh, there's, you know, embrace marketing. Galleries who don't advertise fail. Galleries who don't promote fail. Galleries who don't do a lot of shows fail. Galleries who do not get on the phone and work their list fail. Galleries who don't do direct mail and email marketing, they fail. You have to do all of those things. Just hoping people are going to walk in the door, they're not going to come. You've got to invite them. You've got to draw them in. You've got to pull them in. You've got to get them excited. And congratulations for being 82 and saying, you know what? I am just going to nail it. Congratulations to Nancy Herman. Well, that's it. That's Art Marketing Minute for today. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. So much for a, a minute, right? I guess it ran a little more than a minute. Anyway, let's let's all meet at the Plein Air Convention this year. You know, Kyle Buckland's going to be there. Uh, a lot of, we got 60, 60 instructors some of the top artists in the world are on stage teaching, and then we all go out and we paint together. We celebrate. There's a big vendor hall of art materials specific to plein air. We're going to have a great time. No restriction now. It's exciting. Please come to the plein air convention. Just go to pleinairconvention.com, get your ticket, and you got to get your hotel room too. That's really important. Now, you can also come and join me in New Zealand. Uh, there are 30 seats. I've just confirmed that. There are 30 seats left, and uh, they're going to go quickly because this is fairly new. Just go to paintingnewzealand.com. We're going in September. This September, something to look forward to. And don't forget about entering and putting yourself out there, the Plein Air Salon Art Competition. Just go to pleinairsalon.com. Now, I got a lot going on in my life. I love to be involved and be out there with you guys. I write a thing called Sunday Coffee. It comes every Sunday morning and you can find it. It's kind of my philosophies on life and, and living. It's not so much about art, but I do talk about art once in a while. And uh, you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. Also, I'm on the air daily on Facebook with Art School Live. Um, we have hundreds of artist demonstrations and talks. We have one every day at noon, five days a week. And that's uh, at noon Eastern every weekday. You can subscribe on YouTube uh, just by searching Streamline Art. And make sure you hit the subscribe and notification button. And also, that's where you're going to find all the broadcasts, every one we've done since COVID. Remember, during COVID, uh, we started a week after all this stuff started, and we were on a full year, five days a week, and we were on seven months, seven days a week. So we're we're committed to you guys and we want to just keep doing it. So go and check out Art School Live on, on YouTube at Streamline Art and hit the subscribe button. And please, 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 please follow me on Instagram. It's Eric Rhodes with an A, Rhodes with an A and no E in Rhodes. Okay, Rhodes, R-H-O-A-D-S. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook. That would be really, really cool. I like that. I'm going to post my painting pictures there. I always do. And uh, I hope that uh, I think we're going to be talking to you before Easter, but if not, have a great Easter and celebrate with your family if you possibly can. We're, we're loving seeing families get back together again. Teach them all how to paint. That'll be really exciting. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Thank you for your time today. I'm honored you would tune in. 90 countries, we love that. Drop me an email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. And remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We will see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. 
be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at pleinairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.